Hello, my name is Robert Church, and I'm the organist and choir master here at St. David's. And tonight, I'm here to give you a brief demo on how the organ works. For now, we'll just focus on how the windblown organ works. And in our next session, we'll learn a little bit more about how the digital organ works, kind of like the one we have here at St. David's. Before we get started, when do you think the organ was invented? I'm not talking about the fancy device we might see here today with lights, buttons, knobs, switches, LED displays, and other electronic G wizardry, but when do you think the first primitive windblown organs were created? Any ideas? Maybe the 1700s? Maybe even as early as the 1400s? Turns out, the organ is actually an ancient musical instrument, and its origins date back to the 3rd century BC, when the Greek scholar Stateribus of Alexandria invented a musical device in which the wind supply was created by a water column. This water column displaced air that was blown through a set of tuned whistles. These instruments were later called the hydraulis, and a few hundred years later, around the time of Christ in fact, they could be heard in arenas all around the Roman Empire. By the 7th century AD, the organ had evolved into a device with air created by a more familiar bellows instead of water pressure. By the 8th century, the organs were considered one of the principal instruments of the Eastern Roman Empire, and a large organ was regularly used in the Hippodrome of Constantinople. Now, you might be wondering, how does a musical instrument used during gladiator jousting end up in religious services? Well, the organ's path to the church began in the year 757, when the Byzantine Emperor Constantine V gave a small organ to the Frankish king, Pepin the Short. Hopefully, most of you remember from history class Pepin's famous son, Charlemagne, a ruler who not only unified large parts of Europe, but who was also responsible for great advances in scholarly learning in the Middle Ages. The Carolingian Renaissance, as it's known today, led to great advances in literature, music, art, architecture, and culture. It was Charlemagne, in fact, who encouraged musicians to begin writing down their chants in manuscript form so the same melodies could be performed by various singers to the same text. Now Charlemagne must have been inspired by his father Pepin's little pipe organ, because he had a similar one built and installed in his chapel in Aachen. And it was here in Aachen that the organ and the church were first united in the Western world. Small portable organs became much more common in the medieval period. By the 12th century, the organ began to evolve into a more complicated machine. And by the 14th century, larger, permanently installed organs became much more common. In the early 17th century, the organ had more or less evolved into the complex machine we have today. An instrument with several keyboards and pedals, a range of tones and colors and sounds, and the ability for one musician to control it all. Now that we've covered the history of the organ, let's head inside to the console and learn a little bit more about how we make music with it. Hello and welcome to the console. Before we get started on how all these buttons and controls work, let's go over how pipes make music. An organ contains many pipes, and those pipes fall into two basic families, the flue pipes and the reed pipes. A flue pipe, like this one, works kind of like a whistle, and it makes its noise by wind blowing over this little notch here. Let's hear it. The length of the pipe determines its pitch. So this is a fairly medium-sized pipe, so it has a medium pitch. Here's a really small pipe. And listen to how high-pitched it is. So those are the flue pipes. Now let's take a look at the reed pipes. This is a reed pipe, and it makes its sound by vibrating this brass reed inside this chamber. The brass reed sound is then amplified by this longer tube at the top called the resonator. The length of the reed and the length of the resonator determine the pitch of a reed pipe. Let's see what this one sounds like. Sounds a bit like a trumpet, right? And it's actually designed to be a trumpet stop. So if any of you listening from home play the trumpet or the trombone, you might be thinking of some similarities here. When you play the trumpet or the trombone, your lips vibrate, inside a mouthpiece, right? And that mouthpiece is attached to a series of tubes that sort of amplify that sound, kind of like the reed is amplified by this resonator here. Organ pipes are arranged by their sound color and pitch into ranks. A rank is a set of pipes that all have the same timbre, the same sound, and cover the entire range of the keyboard. The typical organ keyboard, like the one behind me, has 61 notes on it. So you would need 61 pipes to cover that entire keyboard and make up a rank. Those 61 pipes that make up the rank also requires a set of 61 valves to control the wind supply, so that when I press a key, air is sent to that specific pipe, which causes it to speak. Most organs today use electricity to control the wind. When an organist presses down a key, an electric contact is made. The electricity travels through a series of wires and relays to a specific solenoid controlling a valve under that specific pipe. The valve opens, and air is emitted to the pipe, and it speaks. Now, long before the Industrial Revolution and the current wars and whatnot, organs had to use mechanical action to control the winds of the pipes. When the organist pressed a key, a series of levers, rocker arms, cables, and levers would go to work 
to transfer the mechanical energy from the key to a valve under the pipe to open up and let air in so the pipe could speak. We still build organs like that today, even with electricity, and those type of instruments are called trackers. One other thing I want to note, today's organs have electric blowers that make all the wind to keep all those pipes speaking. But long before electricity, what did people do? You guessed it, volunteers from the church or the concert hall would have to help out by pumping the bellows to make the organ play. Some big organs required a lot of volunteers. Sometimes as many as six to eight people pumping six to eight enormous bellows were needed to fill some giant organ with air. Now, imagine if a few of those volunteers didn't show up on a certain Sunday. What would an organist like me do? Well, it would be a lot worse than if volunteers didn't show up for ushering, for example, because the organ wouldn't be playable. Cut. Now let's look at some of the controls in this console. You'll notice there's a lot of knobs on both sides of the instrument. These knobs are called stops, and each stop belongs to a rank of pipes. When I draw a stop, it turns on that rank of pipes. Now again, there's a lot of stop knobs in this console, and remember that each one of these knobs is connected to a rank of 61 pipes. So, for my math geeks listening at home, you can quickly see how the number of pipes on an organ can add up. All of these organ stops are grouped and assigned to different divisions. On this organ, we have four divisions each assigned to a specific keyboard. We have the swell, the grate, the choir. Down here we have the pedal board, the keyboard that I play with my feet. Now let's talk more about the different families of pipes. First, let's return to the flue pipe family. Very thin pipes are called strings because they have a thin, almost string-like tone to them. Here's a sample. Next, we have the diapasons, or the principles. These pipes form the backbone of the entire instrument. They're a medium width pipe, and they're probably what most of you think about when you think of what an organ pipe might look like. Here's a sample. Finally, let's take a look at the flutes. Flute pipes are much, much wider than the strings, and even wider than diapasons. And you guessed it, they have a flute-like tone. Here's a few samples. That pipe would probably be made out of wood. Here's a sample of another flute pipe. So those are the flutes. Now let's turn back to the reed pipe family. Recall earlier we saw the reed pipe with that fancy brass tongue inside that little chamber that vibrated to give us some sound. But let's see what the sounds can actually uh, experience on the organ. First, let's look at some woodwind stops, like the oboe. Or the bassoon. We also have a clarinet. And then there's the uh, familiar trumpet stop we heard earlier. Then my favorite are the big party horns, like this one. And that's the reed pipe family on the keyboards. We also have some reed stops in the pedal board, like the bass trombone, which sounds kind of like this. The numbers on the stop knob, the lower numbers that is, tell me what pitch it's going to sound at. See how there's number eights on all these? That eight tells me that it's an eight foot stop, and it sounds the unison pitch, which makes this middle C. It's called an eight foot stop because the longest pipe in the rank, the pipe that plays low C, all the way down here, is actually a pipe that's eight feet long. Now fortunately for us Americans, the organ is never converted to the metric system. So no matter where you are in the world, you can still find imperial measurements on all the organ stop knobs. Now let's get back to the eight foot stop. Eight foot stops are the backbone of the entire instrument, providing the foundation tone. Remember, eight foot is only the length of the lowest notes, this pipe all the way down here. Every octave we go up on the keyboard, the length of the pipe is cut in half. So if this is eight foot, this C is four foot. Middle C only requires a pipe two feet long. For my math geeks listening at home, how long do you think this note is, the C above middle C? Well, if you thought really hard, two divided in half is one foot. Now, if we look back at some of the numbers on the stop knobs, you'll see some of them are labeled four foot and two foot. Now let's return to the stop knobs on the organ console again. Here's our familiar eight foot stop, and here's middle C. Listen to what happens when I draw a four foot stop, and then a two foot stop. I'm hearing pipes one and two octaves above, and it adds brightness to the ensemble. Let's have a listen. 
Compare that to just the eight foot stop. Makes a big difference in brightness. How about the 16 foot stop? Like this one, Bordon. Where does that fall on the keyboard? Well, if you guess an octave lower, you're correct. Here's an eight foot pitch, and here's the 16. Now let's turn to the pedal board. The pedal board provides the bass line in the organ music, and as such, it has plenty of 16 foot stops. Have a listen. It also has plenty of eight and four foot stops as well. But it's also home to an even deeper pitch, an octave below the 16 foot pitch, which for my math geeks is a pipe 32 feet long. As you can imagine, the largest pipes in this rank are absolutely enormous. Imagine a pipe 32 feet long and big enough around for an average adult to comfortably stand inside. Now you may be wondering, what does something like this sound like? Here's a sample. 32 foot flue pipes are pretty much out of the range of human hearing. You just feel the pipe shaking the room rather than hearing it. Hopefully it's coming through on your home stereo. A 32 foot reed pipe is definitely audible. Here's a sample of that. It doesn't make the nicest sound, however. But when we put these stops under the full organ, they add a thrilling foundation. So turn up the bass on those Beats headphones and listen to the difference with and without the 32 foot stop. Hopefully I'm not busting anyone's speakers here. So here we go without. And now let's add the 32 foot stops. You ready? In the room, it makes a tremendous difference. Hopefully it did as well at home. Before we get into some other organ playing details, there's one more group of stops I need to mention, the mutations. Now I hope all that talk of 16s, 8, and 4 has worn up your math skills, because now we have to deal with some fractions. You'll notice I have a stop here at a 1 and 3 fifths pitch and a 2 and 2 thirds pitch. To save you from calculating what pitches those might sound, I'll just tell you. When I draw the 2 and 2 thirds foot stop and I press middle C, it's actually sounding a G, an octave and a half above. For comparison, I have an eight foot stop on this keyboard. So here's middle C on that. And here's middle C on the two and two thirds stop again. Hear the difference? Now what if I match the pitch down here? Watch where my hand goes. There you have it. Now let's take a look at the one and three fifths pitch stop. Let's press middle C again. Listen to how different that is. The one and three fifths stop when I play middle C is actually pressing down an E two and a half octaves above. You might be wondering why the organ has all these mutation stops. What do they really do? Let's take a sample of the solo line of an opening hymn with just an eight foot stop. Now let's try adding the two and two thirds and hear how it sounds. Kind of makes it stand out more. Let's add the one and three fifths to that. Even better. Now let's add our friends the four foot and the two foot stop that we discussed earlier and listen one more time. As you can see, mutations add lots of color to the solo line and really make it stand out. The final group of stops I want to discuss are called mixtures like this one, with the name mixture and a Roman numeral on the stop face. The name mixture applies here because the stop contains a mixture of several different ranks of pipes. We learned earlier about the mutations and we heard that they contain pipes that sound a unison, a fifth, and a third above the unison pitch. Mixtures are compound stops that contain several ranks of pipes, speaking at all different pitches. Let's have a listen to what some of them sound like. It doesn't sound so great on its own, now does it? But let's add it to a full ensemble and hear what it sounds like. Mixtures add lots of brilliance to the ensemble. Listen to it without one more time. And here it is with again. As you can see, mixtures add brilliance and a thrilling cap to the basic ensemble. Now that we've learned about all the different stops on the organ, let's learn about how we control the volume of the instrument. I'm sure you're noticing that as I add stops, the organ gets louder and louder. Take a listen. 
If you're familiar with the expression, pulling out all the stops, well, it comes from the organ, because pulling out all the stops makes it louder and louder and louder. One thing I want to note about the organ, though, is that the keys are not touch sensitive. No matter how hard or how gently I press down the key, it still speaks with the same volume. Think about that for a minute. How does that differ from another keyboard instrument? The most popular of all keyboard instruments, for example. The one you probably have in your living room, the piano. What happens when you press a piano key down? If you press it hard, it's loud. If you gently tap it, it's pretty soft. Let's head to the piano for a minute and see what for ourselves. Hello and welcome to the piano. So the piano is a musical instrument that was invented in Italy in the early 1700s by Bartolomeo Cristofori. So it's only about 300 years old. Now compare that to the organ, which is 2,000 years older. I mean, imagine that. This piano, this popular instrument that's in most homes in America, is 2,000 years younger than the organ. Who knew? Now, most of you from home are probably familiar with how the piano works. When I press a key, a hammer strikes a string. So the piano is actually considered a percussion instrument, not a string instrument. And its name, piano, comes from the Italian piano forte, which means loud and soft. Let's listen for a minute. So I can easily play softly or very loudly. Let's head back to the organ and see how we can play louder on that instrument and softer as well. We've already seen how we can make the organ louder and softer by adding or subtracting stops. Most modern organs, however, have a device called a swell box. Usually, an entire division of pipes are located inside the swell box, which has a set of louvered doors on its front. These expression shoes above the pedal board open and close those louvered doors, making the pipes in that box sound louder and softer just by moving my foot. On this organ, two of the four divisions are contained in swell boxes. So by drawing the softest stops and closing the box, I can go from playing very softly to playing very loudly. One other trick the modern organist has up his sleeve is the combination action. Using modern computer chips, the organ console has a memory which allows me to pre-program different combinations of stop knobs on these buttons called pistons. Note how when I press these buttons, different combinations of stop knobs light up. These combinations allow me to change registrations on the fly. So when I'm playing an organ piece or even a hymn, I'm frequently pressing these pistons to change the stops. Now let's put it all together. Using the combination action and the swell boxes, we're going to go from playing very softly to very loudly all in the span of one verse of a very popular hymn. Join me in C. Before electricity and this modern combination action, the organist pretty much had to rely on assistance to help him change stops. So if you had a larger instrument like this with lots of knobs, the organist probably had two friends on each side of him pulling stop knobs out as the piece moved along. Now, if any of you have ever had the chore of having to turn pages for me or anyone else, you know how stressful that can be. Imagine adding pulling stops along with page turning. Probably not the most fun way to spend your Sunday morning in a church service. So that's basically it, folks. Um, when we're all back in church sometime when this is all over, please come up and see me at the console. And if you play the piano, why not give it a try? Until then, please stay safe. And I hope everyone is well. And I hope your family is well. Thank you. And have a great night.